Swami Swami, the work of an architect at Musk, so the previous speaker is a friend of mine and we are colleagues. He gave a very humble introduction about it himself. I'll give a little bit of expanded one, right? Yeah. Have you guys seen the containers, Musk containers? Yes. The physical containers? So we work on the software containers, which runs on Kubernetes that empowers the physical containers. Sounds cool? Containers for containers. Containers for containers, yes. So we offer the software containers that operate the actual physical containers throughout the world. It's a, we both are working as a cloud native architects there. So my focus area is mostly on cloud and DevOps side of it as well. You see a dotnet developer uh, before I joined them, maybe a couple of years before. So then I was a dotnet developer and then now I'm more into the cloud side of it. Working on Kubernetes, DevOps, and Terraform, and you can think of anything on cloud native, yeah, kind of touching my hands there in it. I'm also myself MVP under developer technologies. I've been to community, or I've been participating in community events for the past 10 years, since 2012 or so. And since seven, eight years, I've been also an organizer of multiple communities in Bangalore. I'm not sure how many have heard about B.NET. It's one of the oldest user groups in Bangalore, Bangalore.NET user group. So I'm like the third or fourth lead in that. It's been running for close to 20 years. I'm not running. In 2023, it's going to be my 20 years. So since 2015 or 2016, I'm part of that and then organizing meetups there. So I'm also an MVP uh, for almost seven years now. Yeah, and that, those are my social handles. You can follow me on Twitter and I used to write blogs now in the last couple of years I didn't write much of blogs but I started posting some YouTube videos that was also like a failed YouTuber you can, you can tell so I created a few videos in 2020 and then consistency is still I'm trying to pick up and that's my GitHub handle and the other than these I uh, also speak in a lot of these meetups and conferences and photography is under interest of mine and playing table tennis I also got interested in home automation doing I think I got inspired from Anand here in one of the meetups when I set up a home automation basically in you know, watering self watering system in my house, looking at what I saw here. So yeah, those kind of small things I keep doing. Alright, so now the agenda is with a, it's a very short session, maybe hopefully. <laughs> so what are GitHub Actions will understand and then we'll understand why do we need to really go with GitHub Actions and then we'll understand some of the core concepts and we'll move on to demo. Yeah. So what are GitHub Actions? Anyone? Have you guys heard about it? Heard about it? So what do you hear? <laughs> Just heard about it. You saw it in the poster of this uh, meetup only or prior to that? So previously I have seen it but uh, didn't explore it. Okay, so what's your uh, take so far? That's fine. It's an informal session guys, so feel free to answer. I'm not taking any interviews or anything. Trigger during check-in Okay, you can trigger things during check-in and check-outs. Okay, that's a good thing. And then? Build automation, okay. CICD kind of. CICD, okay. Web hooks, okay. You can trigger web hooks, you mean, or? Right. Alright, uh, there's no distraction there. When you commit something, you can connect to all the CICD. Okay, that's a separate thing. Web hook is a different concept altogether, but yeah, that can also be used within this. Okay, any other versions? Build, yeah. Source control. Source control, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so pretty much whatever you are doing within GitHub, right, you can automate everything there. Be it starting from the creation of your repository to let's say if you want to set up your branching strategies appropriately, you can do your branch management, you can do your repository management, you can run your CACD pipelines, right, if let's say if you are running an open source project, if you want to handle some sort of an issue handling, etc., if you want to label some of these issues, right, a lot of things can be done with, you know, GitHub actions. So I think if you go to the website, you can automate your workflow from idea to protection, right, so anything and everything can do with that. Some of the things like code reviews or branch management. Let's say, for example, if you want to set up some sort of a branching strategy, like a master branch or a trunk based development or a git flow based development and things like that, right? Okay, before I go, maybe I'll take a step back. Have you, anyone been using Azure DevOps before? You all are understanding what is Azure DevOps, right? And DevOps concepts, you're kind of, kind of familiar with it, right? Okay, that's good. So, let's say if you want to have a consistent branching across your multiple, uh, multiple repositories, how do you do that, right? You might need to create a repository manually and then go and create these different branches. Go create a master branch and then create maybe a dev branch and then a feature branches, etc. If you want to automate that, let's say anytime a new repository is created, I want to automatically have those branching strategy baked into it. But you can do that with GitHub Actions, etc. And repo management, let's say, like I said, even when creating a new repository, if you go to GitHub, there are so many repository settings that are available, right? You can choose who are the collaborators for your particular repository, what kind of branch protection rules you can give. Or if you want to enable the GitHub pages, you can do that, right? So all of those things also can be done at a user repositories. If you want to do that at a scale for multiple repositories, you can use GitHub Actions to automate such tasks as well, right? And of course, issue triaging, for example, you, uh, most of you have seen a lot of these open source projects, right? Are you guys at least browsing the open source projects in GitHub? Any open source contributors? 
that's, that's good. So you might know how the issues are created and then you will you'll have a lot of labels on the issues like up for grabs, or first timers and things like that. So a lot of things are possible with that. So we can create all of those with GitHub Actions as well. It's if you are running an open source project and you have your documentation in a specific folder and you have your source code in a specific folder in the repository. So issue triaging is very much possible with GitHub Actions. Let's say if somebody is creating an issue on your documentation folder, right? You need to know okay, to which team you need to, that needs to go. Let's say if in your team if somebody is managing documentation, somebody else is managing a source control, and if somebody else is managing infrastructure, triaging that manually is going to be unnecessary uh, uh, toil, right? So, so you can avoid that by using uh, GitHub Actions. And of course, CACD is a very popular one, mostly focused for developers, right? This is what most of us would be more interested in, and which is what this is the focus of uh, the session's demo as well. Right. Say so CD, I hope everyone understands it. Continuous integration and continuous deployments. Yeah, and of course they can do a lot more things as well. And then why GitHub Actions? Some of these what I told, can you think you can can you do it in any other tools as well? Sorry, GitLabs, okay. Jenkins, okay. Say so CD of course is possible with a lot of tools. Right? Jenkins is one of it, Azure DevOps that we've all, we've all been using for quite some time. GitLabs, other things, etc. Right? But there are certain certain selling features available in GitHub Actions, which is what I'm going to talk about here. Right? So now GitHub Actions can run on all these different platforms. Let's say if you're targeting a Linux application or a Mac OS or Windows or ARM or containers, you can run all of in all of these platforms. And there's something called concept of matrix builds. Right? So what that means is let's say if you are I hope all of your .NET developers, right? So dot net versions keep changing. What is the current version? Seven. 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 Seven, uh, 7 is an STS short term, this one standard term support. LTS is the .NET 6, right? And then by next .NET component comes, it becomes .NET 8. So now how do you ensure if you are a library author, how do you ensure your .NET builds are really uh, working across multiple uh, versions of a .NET, right? Let's say you get a library with .NET 5, and then when .NET 6 comes, you will upgrade that in .NET 6. And then when 7 comes, you might need to upgrade and then provide the supports. That means your code is same, but you need to target your builds across multiple versions of it, right? That is where you can use something called matrix builds in within GitHub Actions. Let's show a demo of how that works. And then of course, in this context, in this meetup, we're talking about .NET and Azure, but GitHub Actions are applicable for anything. You can use for your Java applications, or Python, Go, JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, anything you can use on you know, GitHub Actions. And also from the deployment perspective also, I'm going to talk about Azure today, but it's not restricted to Azure. You can deploy it on GCP or AWS or any other cloud as well. And of course, when Actions run, you'll always get a live blog to look at how the things are happening, how your builds are progressing, what kind of errors you are getting. And it also comes with a built in secret store, right? So when you run any builds, you obviously you need some sort of secrets to inject into your application, right? We are not really, are, has anyone committed a secret into a GitHub repository directly? We all have done it, it's okay, no, no harm in telling that, right? I have done myself and then you clean it up later, right? And then what we do typically to us that we kind of use a secret store somewhere else, maybe then you put it in Azure key or somewhere else and then you dynamically pull it and then you inject into it, right? So you don't have to go with any other external secret store. GitHub itself is having its own secret store. That's what is the built-in secret store. So everything stays in your repository, right? And there are also options of multi-container testing. Let's say if you're working with a multiple container kind of an application, right? let's say you have a front-end and the box to a back-end API and then the API box to a back and the database, etc. Right? All of these things, if you want to test it as part of your CSD pipelines, you can very well orchestrate those multi-container uh, applications and then you can test them. And of course, it's open source, it's completely built and open, and then there's a lot of community powered workflows are available. Right? And we'll just even demystify what is the workflow in the next uh, few slides. Right? So now, we're talking about the core concepts. Right? So runners are the, are the guys who are going to execute this entire thing. Right? So if you are coming from Azure DevOps world, you must have got something called agents, build agents, right? That's what is the synonymous to runners here. So that's the infrastructure where all of our workflows are going to run. So what is going to run is what is the workflow basically. A workflow is nothing but your entire uh, orchestration, what you are trying to do there. It's in the form of an YAML file. You, let's say if it's a CICD, you get a CICD as one of your workflow. If you want to do your living issue triaging, that could be under workflow. If you want to say hi to someone who is a person contributor to your repository, that could be under workflow. Anything you are automating is a workflow in there. Right? What is a like, workflow comprise of? It comprises of multiple jobs. It comprises multiple jobs basically, right? So workflow is a top level thing. You can have multiple jobs different inside it. Each of the jobs can get executed either in parallel or you can bring in those uh, dependencies between each of them as appropriately. And what are the job comprised? It comprises multiple steps. So you can get steps are the ones which you define like let's say I want to 
check out the repository, this one of the step. Then I want to do a .NET build, this one of my step. Then I want to do a .NET, then maybe test to run my test is another step. And then .NET publish will be another steps, right? And the steps are made up of basically some of these actions are tasks. So action is the smallest unit in your entire bit of actions, right? So you create multiple actions in form of steps, multiple steps form a job, multiple jobs form a workflow, and this entire workflow gets run and run that. Yeah. So it's just uh, goes from here. And there are also some more things. So when we say a workflow is when should it run, right? There has to be some sort of a trigger for it. That's where the events comes into picture. The events could be anything like whenever you push a particular a change into a repository or to a branch or whenever you get a pull request or whenever a new issue is created if you want to react it and assign it to a specific team right or whenever there's a release is created right? all of these are different events there are a number of events available in the documentation i have just typed this down a few here right and you can also run things on a scheduled basis let's say on every week i want to run a security scan of all my repositories to ensure all of them are really the right good shape and form without any security vulnerabilities etc right you can very well do that as well so it's what's an event and then, of course, whenever you run a build, it's going to generate some artifacts, right? So some of the artifacts will be like binary files. Let's say if you have a .NET application, you create DLS, this will be one of the artifacts. If you have a Java application, you create Java. If it's anything else, it will be something else as well, right? And then if you have your test results, if you're running a JUnit test or XUnit test or whatever be the unit test, you write those kind of test results. And then your screenshots and logs, all of these are part of artifacts. And uh, when we talk about runners, there are a couple of, there is also on transfer self-hosted runners. That means, so even in Azure DevOps world, you must have seen self-hosted agents, right? That means you will have control, full control over your agent in which your uh, applications are not happening. So the build is going to run, right? If, let's say if you want to use a specific version of an hardened image of your enterprise and you don't want to go with an uh, cloud-based uh, runners or so, right? You can use those. The same thing is applicable here as well. It's called self-hosted runners here. So where we are, we'll have a custom hardware and software so that we know what are the things that is running in that particular machine. So far, and yeah, so this is just an uh, uh, comparison between GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps. This is one of the questions which I've been hearing from quite a few times when I did the session, so I just put this together. So, in, if you're writing and if you're familiar with an, um, you know, I think I should have put an comparison YAML file. Sorry, I didn't do that. It's just table column here. So you can visualize if you're writing an YAML in Azure DevOps, you have something called trigger on top. That's the first thing to start with, right? In the trigger, you will say maybe push or whatever, pull request, etc. So it's called on here. From a syntactical perspective, you will say on, and that is when that's what is going to affect your trigger. And then the cloud-based agents are called hosted agents there, but in terms of terminology, it's called runners here in GitHub Actions. Right? And BIO is nothing but bring your own agents, so it's called self-hosted agents there, and it's called self-hosted runners here. And you can also have a concept of, I mean, you have a concept of variables in say libraries in Azure DevOps, if you use that, if you want to integrate it dynamically. So you also have those environment variables here as well. That's what I put it, it's just E and B, not a Q is there. And then secrets, yeah, you have an option to either store as a secret in a variable groups itself, or you put it in Azure Key Vault and then you dynamically you pull it. So here you have a built-in secret store. And let's say if you are going with the concept of mono repository. So you sort of put this mono repo. That means you have a lot of things in the same repository. Like I said, you can have your source control, source code of your application, it's a dotted application, and then your documentation, and then your infrastructure code also can be part of the same thing. This is one sort of mono repo. Or let's say if you're having multiple different services that, that comprises, I mean that basically forms an entire application. You can have all of those different services in the same repository but under different different folders. Right? And then if, if on a specific folder, a specific change is happening, you may need to trigger the build of only that particular folder later changes. You don't have to build the entire repository again. Right? That's where you use something called this path filters. So you'll use include or exclude in the Azure DevOps world. It's called paths and then paths ignore. And like I said, the jobs can run in parallel, by default they run in parallel, or they run in parallel. So if you want to make it sequential, you need to use something called needs. In the Azure DevOps, you have to use something called depends on. Let's say I have a build job, and after the build job is completed, then I can do a deployment, right? Otherwise, there's no point in doing deployment separately. So you use something called the deployment depends on build. Now in this case, you will say deployment needs needs build. That's how the technology is going to change. And you can, uh, the manually triggering of pipelines, it was always possible with Azure DevOps because the way your pipeline is set itself is, though you have an uh, the Azure Pipelines YAML created in your repository, you need to go to Azure DevOps once and then choose it and then create your uh, actual pipeline enabled there. And then you always have the option to go and trigger it manually. But here you need to enable separate uh, things called workflow dispatch, I'll show the demo again. Only then you'll be able to trigger the pipelines manually. Right? And the reusable pipeline components, only if you have used pipeline templates. I've heard about templates in Azure DevOps. What about it? Yeah. 
So it appears nothing, but let's say if you're working in a bigger enterprise, right? You might have a, a, a set of teams working on .NET based application. And as an enterprise, you need to define what our .NET build should run. If I need to run my whatever the check out of the code and then build it, run unit tests, run sonar scan or whatever static code analysis, and security scans, and then I need to publish my artifact somewhere, right? So you don't want to keep on running these 10, 50 steps in every other build. You don't have to keep on creating YAML files for that. So you get something like a usable template. You put it there, and then you refer that in, in all of our different. Uh, Microservices or different applications wherever you want to use it, right? It's called pipeline templates. There, you can create the templates at different levels. You can have a job template or you can have an, uh, you know, a step template, different other things. But here, it's called reusable workflows. Uh, there are two things here. One is called composite action, and one is called reusable workflows. So I'll, I'll explain in the demo when I show uh, what is the difference between both of them. And the moment you have reusable things, you need to also have to pass some parameters right? so that you can customize that particular template to run based depending on from which context it is going to run. So to pass the parameters, you use actually call the parameters is what you define there. But here it's all inputs in GitHub action. And uh, for all you want to run any condition execution, let's say only for the builds that are triggered on master branch commits. If you want to run a specific set of uh, activity, let's say you want to build Docker image and then push it. But you will use a condition statement there in Azure DevOps. So here it's called if. It's very simple as just put an if condition. It will just want to work on that. These are some of the high level differences between these two. But under the hood, if you look at it, the hosted agents or the runners are all provisioned by Microsoft for us. So it's all cloud hosted agents if we are using the uh, cloud hosted agents. If you are going with self hosted, is when we need to do the manual wire up between the repository and our uh, runner, whatever we are going to have. Yeah. And that's, that's about it. So let's give you a demo. Okay. So what I've done is I've created a repository already in GitHub. Okay, so it's called ghactions.npl.r demo. I'll share the links uh, after the session, anyways, right? And then you can take a look at it. Um, so as you can see here, I, I put put together a list of features what are being showcased in this repository, right? So let's understand how we can do a .NET library build with matrix strategy, right? And then let's also look at how we can uh, you know, build the .NET web API, and then we can deploy it into Azure Web App, and we also look at how we can use actions and using different environment production tools, etc, etc, yeah. So before we get in there, how do you get started with GitHub Actions? As usual, search in your favorite uh, search engine, search for GitHub Actions, and you go look at the documentation here, right? The documentation is pretty neat, you can get started with, uh, with, with the documentation itself, you can go to Quick Start and then you can understand uh, how you can create a GitHub Actions uh, from these uh, documentation itself, all right? Now, one other thing uh, we want to understand is the marketplace, basically. Uh, so you can just go and look at for GitHub Actions marketplace. That is where all these community powered workflows are present. So for the most commonly used tasks are the things already the actions are available. You might not have a need to really go and create anything for yourself. Let's say if you think about .NET build or Java build or TypeScript builds or NPM packages, whatever it. For all those already actions are present. And again, like I said, again for deployment, also deploying it to Azure or deploying it to GCP or AWS, uh, for all those actions are present. If in case you see that some of the actions are not really present, we also have the option to go and create our own custom actions and then we can publish. There are two ways. If you're an enterprise, if you want to create your own internal actions to be used within your enterprise, you can very well do that. Post it in your own internal repositories of your uh, GitHub organization and then you can refer it in any other, uh, any of other bills. Or if you want to make it public as a public contribution, you can very well do that here as well. So as you can go and see here, these are different categories of actions present here. Let's say, for example, I'll go and search for Azure, yeah, right? So these are the different Azure-related things. If you want to deploy into Azure Web App, or you want to do it into you know, static web app deployment, or ACI, the Azure Container Instances, or if you want to do a Kubernetes-based deployments, right? All of different things are present. So what you see as this tick is like a verified publisher, basically, in GitHub. So these are all built by Azure itself, and there will definitely be a lot of third-party Packages as well, not the packages, sorry, the actions as well. As you can see, these are all like not having the tick marks here, right? So you can also go and filter out here, verified creator, so that you will you will get to see only the verified actions here, right? So the reason why I'm stressing that is you can you have to choose categories, what actions you are running and what kind of support it is having. Of course, with any open source project, it's, it's good for us to use it, but you also need to understand if there are any issues, who is there to maintain it, or if we are really having time to go and uh, uh, put our contributions, etc., right? So if you're starting, it will be good to go with a verified uh, action so that you are guaranteed that okay, it's, it's, it's all uh, managed, uh, well managed. Yeah. Okay. So now let's go back to this uh, repository. 
hope it's all visible right yeah so what I've done is I just created I mean I kind of found a monorepo here with multiple different applications as you can see one is a web API demo that's where they have the web API specific code there and then there's this library and there's this function right and I'm not going to do any live coding now I've just kind of coded it in the interest of time so that I just explain what is really happening in each of these right so all these applications are very simple whatever you get out of a .NET template is what I've done .NET new web API if you do whatever the code API that's what is present in web API and whatever .NET new class lib you do it is just it is just that as you can see I've not even changed that there's no line of code present in here so because interest is more on the GitHub action spot I didn't really spend time on writing the code here uh, yeah and function is also like the basic HTTP trigger function right that's what it is so now, so whenever you want to start with uh, GitHub Actions, there are two ways to do it. Or one of the main thing is uh, you need to have this convention basically. As you can see, dot GitHub is a folder that needs to be created in every repository where you want to create an action. And inside that, uh, I've created this workflows folder, and here is where I've created multiple folders. Okay. So you can use any of your uh, IDE of your choice, either Visual Studio or VS Code or whatever. I'm using VS Code here. This also has some intelligent support uh, depending on schemas what are being applied for uh, GitHub Actions. So I've, I've coded it from here. Or the easiest way to get started is let's see if you go to this actions tab here right, in your GitHub repository, you can get a new workflow. Okay, click on the new workflow, and it automatically understands your uh, your repository and it, it comes up with suggestions. Okay, like what what is that you can configure in this particular repository, right? So here, since I've already configured some of the builds, it is not showing it. Otherwise, it will just show .NET build whatever if you want, right? So you can go search for .NET. Yeah, so these are the different you know .NET uh, builds available. So I'll just say configure here and it automatically gives you the workflow for you, right? So now let's start understanding what this workflow uh, means for us, right? So uh, this is the name of the workflow when it runs, it just says .NET when you run the workflow and here is where the, maybe I'll go to 3D mode. Text is visible, right? Or do you need to, want me to zoom in better? Yeah, so this on, like I said, this is a trigger. That means whenever there's a push that happens to these branches, right? Main branch, whenever there's a push that happens to main branch, or whenever there's a pull request that's created on the main branch, is when the rest of the workflow is going to run. This is the event what we are uh, defining, right? And what are the jobs it is going to have? This is the, that is defined in the job section. This is the build job, and that is going to run on Ubuntu latest. So the, here is where we are using the cloud hosted runners, GitHub hosted runners here, right? And uh, like I said, this job is going to have multiple steps and these are the steps that are defined below. First thing is you need to check out this particular repository in that particular agent machine, wherever it is running, right? the runner basically. And then we are setting up .NET. Uh, by default it is coming up with the 6.0.x. Of course you can change it if at all you are still running on 5.0, you can just go ahead and modify it. You can preview mode. And then these are the different steps what it brings up. right? You can very well directly go here and uh, start committing from directly from here. And then it will automatically start figuring this workflow. That is the easiest way to get started, right? And also, you can also go and change, I mean, uh, search for options. So, let's say if you want to upload an artifact here. Upload, upload a build artifact is another thing here, right? You can just go here and then just copy the, uh, copy the action uh, snippet there, and then you can come here and just paste it, right? And of course, the YAML syntax and other syntax and other things you need to ensure. Uh, so, you can just do that. And it also has IntelliSense control space effectors, it should show a few things. So it's not coming here. Bad indentation. So then, okay. Anyway, so that's a typical YAML issue, right? How many of your YAML fans here? I don't think I'll ever get an answer for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so these things should go here, I believe. Yeah, basically, yeah, you can edit here, and it also has this intelligence. I've seen that looking before. I think maybe I I messed up some other things here, so. Yeah, there you go. I think I, the snippet what I pasted is what was not having a problem. See, was having a problem. So yeah, so you can set up uh, some of these things from here itself. So one easy way is to go directly here and then uh, start creating your first set of beta actions, right? Other way, like I said, is I created these YAML files here. So let's take a look at the library path first, right? Uh, so now again, this is a building a dot and library is the name I've given for this workflow. And on branch, same thing here, on push to any branch main is what I'm doing. I'm not running this build on a pull request. That's why you don't see you don't see any pull request there, right? You just see only one event called push here. Oh, sorry, I think yeah, I also have it below. And I'm giving a path here as library demo slash star star. That means whenever any code is getting pushed into this particular library demo folder, only then this particular action will run. Because I have multiple projects inside this, right? I have this function, library, and then web API. 
So to, uh, to differentiate that, you can use this path filter here. Yeah, and I have for both pull request and push. And this is a workflow dispatch is what you need to add so that we'll get the ability to go and trigger it manually. Let's say while testing, you don't want to really commit your code, but you want to test your YAML files or anything, right? how things are working fine in the YAML what you've created. You can enable this workflow dispatch, then you will have the ability to go and build on, on, on demand. Right? And this is how you define an environment variable. Like in environment, I'll say I'm just giving the library path as dot slash library demo. Right? And again, same thing, jobs, build as a job name, and this is a run sum. And here is what is the matrix part which I talked about. You see in line number 22 to 23, matrix I'm setting up, the uh, matrix name is called .NET version, and the version I have defined three different versions here, 5.0.x, 6.0.x, and 7.0.x, right? And if you look at this particular library project, it's created in .NET 5.0, right? So I'm just trying to check if my 5.0 library is compatible with 6.0 or 7.0 whenever that comes in. That way you can see what are, if there are any compatibility issues and how do you really go and fix it. And of course, I'm just trying to get the idea, convert the, this code, there's no code in here, so don't go literally by that. Okay, it is obviously it's going to work because it's just an empty class, but you get the point, right? Like why and where do we use the libraries? So here, what we will say is now the name we are telling is running dot net version, and this is how we'll we'll use interpolations here to use any variables which we have defined above. So here we are, I'm telling matrix dot dot net version. So this matrix dot dot net version is what I'm going to run it, and these are the steps what we are going to run, right? Steps wise, it's the same. I'm setting up the dot net. I'm setting up the dot net version with this version. So if you look at the sample which was uh, which came in here, that has a fixer version number here, right? Which is 6.0.x. But what we are doing here is we are trying to do with the matrix because we want to run the same build across multiple versions. That means every time the build runs, it needs to run against that particular target, right? Which is what we are setting here. And these oh, these ones are uh, this is how you use an environment variable, right? env dot library path is what I'm using, which is nothing but this particular path here, whatever I've given. I'm doing a dot net restore and then I'm doing a dot net build. Pretty simple, right? Now let's go ahead and understand how this really works. So once you have that created, if you go to the actions, you can see these different actions available because I have those committed into my repository. So if you go to the build.net library, I'm not making any code changes to that, but still I'm going to run that workflow. That ability came because of that workflow dispatch command what I've added there, right? So let me say uh, run workflow, right? Then it automatically triggers the workflow. Yeah. So if you look at it now, uh, we've defined only one workflow file, right? But as you can see, the left hand side is running for three different targets. That is what the matrix is. You just define one all the sequence of steps and run it across multiple versions. Let's say if you are building a cross-platform application, for example, something using Blazor, uh, Mobile, or whatever, right? or Mavi, or whatever, you need to make sure it builds across your uh, uh, what is it, Android, iOS as well, right? And, and of course, even the .NET library for that matter, it needs to work across multiple versions or it needs to work across multiple operating systems also. .NET is cross platform now, right? What if you are using a specific Windows only library is there? How do you identify that? Uh, if you are, then it will break if you are building it against a Linux machine also, right? So in such cases also, you can use this matrix concept. Are you, are you getting it? Yeah, where it can be applied. And the application is much simple for us. Like I showed in, in the same set of lines, we are able to run it. And this is how we will we'll get the individual jobs done. So basically it creates multiple jobs and each of these jobs will run in its own runners. So if you go to the setup job, if you expand it, you can see that the current runner version, what it is using, the operating system, which, which will be Ubuntu, because we have mentioned as Ubuntu latest is what we have given there, right? which is what is uh, taken here. And the runner image is whatever the version of that image and all these different things you can see. The same thing will happen for each and every uh, everything. What would differ is the setup.net task, because here is where in this particular build is for uh, 6.0.x, so here it should be uh, pulling the 6.0 version, 6.0.403. If you go to 7, it would uh, pull that 7.0. whatever the version available, so 7.0.100. Right? But rest all code and all of our things are the same. Are you guys with me so far? So here in this, there are no, uh, not uploading any artifacts, so you don't see anything below. Right? So once the action runs, you need to come to the actions tab and then look at this summary here. So it's like I showed, this is the main action page where you'll see all the different runs, whatever has happened before in this repository, right? So if you choose individual uh, runs, you can see how each one has, uh, what is the history of runs for these individual uh, uh, workflows, right? Yeah, okay, so that's about the matrix part. So now maybe let's switch yes a little bit and move on to the functions part, right? So functions demo. Yeah, function also like I said, it's a plain old HTTP trigger. 
and the function what we need to do, we need to build the universe and deploy it into an Azure function, which is what we wanted. Only then the function can be executed by anyone in the anyone in of you also now, right? So again, for that what I've done is I've created this workflow here called dotnet func CICD, right? This could be a little more expanded one. Okay, uh, the function. Okay, I've used the workflow here. Okay. Um, so this part I think so far you are clear on it, right? This is what we just saw in a couple of times and then we are going to run it on Azure. And now here if you look at the steps here, I am not running those .NET build or checkout .NET build, .NET restore, .NET publish, all those are not seen here, right? What you see is build .NET app is one of the actions I am running here. If you see the syntax change here on line number 19, this is a step, the name of the step is build and publish web, web API app and that is going to use an actions here. Here is where I use a reusable composite action here. I will explain what it is. Let's see if you go to this GitHub Actions folder, I created something called build.net app. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So what I have done is I have created a uh, composite action. So the way to create it is you can create it under any folder and there is something you need to create something called action.yaml file. Okay, the nomenclature needs to be maintained. It is called action.yaml and you have to define the name of that action and the inputs. This is, these are the uh, inputs that I need to pass whenever I need to call this particular action. And then I am going to pass .NET project path and then .NET CS project name and then the artifact name what I want to create. These are some of the three parameters for this particular uh, and the important thing is this runs using composite. That means it is a composite action. Composite action is nothing but it is an encapsulation of multiple uh, steps and this, this set of steps which you want, wherever you want to replicate it, you just use this single action there. So now if you can see the steps, it is pretty much the same, right? Set up .NET and then restore the dependencies. So here I can't give the direct project path, right? Because this needs to be a generic one. That's why I am taking it from the inputs here. Inputs .NET project path and then .NET project name. And finally what I am doing is, I am just uploading the artifact into uh, uploading artifact as well. This is an action. So there are multiple things you can create these actions in the same repository. In, in my case, I am just using this action in this repository's workflows only. It is I put in this local scope of this repository. But typically you will not do that. Right? If you are an enterprise, you want to make this action shared across multiple other repositories as well. Then you have a common repository you created and then put these actions there and then you can, uh, you have to check out that repository as part of your uh, consuming repositories. Yeah? Getting it? That's how you can reuse these actions across multiple repositories. See here it's locally scoped, so I, I directly access this like this dot github slash action slash build dot net app. It, this checkout action itself will bring in basically this checkout action. Sorry, one, one minute. This checkout action is checking out the entire repository. Right? In my entire repository, I have these actions in this folder called GitHub Actions. So that's how I'm using this directly here. If in case it's it's in a different repository, I would say check out with that particular repository name I have to use in the users. Yeah, yeah, I was just asking that actions that ML is something that we can also package and deploy it internally, right? In that case, we don't have to check out the repo, but just that we can have that as a GitHub action itself. Now, what you were talking about is taking the custom actions. Yeah. Okay, that's a different thing. So, this is a composite action, means you have to check out that particular repository. Basically, your action is defined somewhere else, and you are trying to write, I mean, use that action. Okay. See, for example, uh, here, it uses actions uh, slash checkout at v3. We are not really checking out a repository per se. What we are using is an existing GitHub action which is available in the marketplace. So GitHub can read it. Right? Let's say if we want to publish our own internal actions to our organization, right? Then you can do that as well. You can publish it into your own internal this one, then you refer it from there. Right? But what I am talking about is a custom action. Are you able to identify the differences between custom actions and a composite action? So this yeah? is a universal sort of action is present and from there is pulling that action. Yes, this checkout is an uh, already available action in the GitHub Action Marketplace. So we are just doing this, we are not specifying any repository names or anything like that. But these are all, and, and this is an yeah, generic action as well, universal action that is applicable for every other uh, repository, you can use it. But what we are creating is a composite action that is only to enable the reusability of the steps what we are having currently. Yeah? Same as templates. Same as templates, exactly, That's yes. Right. The reusable templates what you create in uh, um, Azure DevOps, it's a similar thing. Composite or not action, it's a group of steps. It is an action, uh, that's why we get like an action.yaml file. So what I am what I'm trying to differentiate is, 
you can also create this as an uh, as an uh, and publish into marketplace in general. We are not doing that. That's a custom action part. What I'm talking about. That needs a little more things. It's not just only this action YAML file. See, these actions how they execute is two things. You can write using JavaScript or you can write create a Docker container and you can run it in a Docker container. Okay. Additional set setup is needed to publish a custom action into the marketplace. But what we are doing is only using the existing runners and we are trying to use existing steps and then making it a reusable component and then publishing it in some repository. Okay. Yeah. Well, Correct. It's just for reusability basically. See, I'll, I'll also explain how it is helping out here. It's in, this is a function app where I've used this. Again, if I go to the web app also, in my web app deployment, as I mean the build part also, I'm using the same thing. See, build.net app is what I've used here. If I don't do this reusable part, what would happen is in everywhere I need to do a .NET build. I may need to create these 20, 30 lines of code, right? Which is very basic one. Imagine you want to add your running of unit tests, running of your static code analysis, running of your security scans, and then do whatever other things, right? Minimum, you will write at least 50 to 80 lines of code for your uh, one particular microservice build action itself. Right? And it's another repetition. Tomorrow, let's say if you want to do a new step for your builds across, how will you do that? You can't go to 50 different repositories and keep on changing it, right? Instead, if you push this in a composite action, then when everyone is referring to a composite action, if they just change that particular version number, then done. You can introduce new steps into it. Right? That's where the composite actions would help us. Okay, so now going back to the function part, so I am using that here in the composite action. So this is one job, as you can see the jobs we have, as we can just hold in here. This is a build and publish, is one of the jobs, which is time to do a .NET build and publish the artifact. Second one is deploying it to Azure function. And so now, if I don't give any dependencies, both of them will run parallel, right? So what I have done is, I put this thing called needs, which says build and publish here. Right, and uh, since this is going to, and any, every job will run in its own runners, okay? The, the runners are not shared between multiple jobs. That means when a job, whenever you start a job, a runner will be provisioned, it executes the steps, it, it cleans it up the moment, the moment the job is complete. And then again for another job, a new runner will come in. Right? So whatever the artifact you published here, it's not going to be available in the runner runner. Right? So that's the first thing what I'm doing here to download the artifact. That's where the name of the artifact comes into picture. So here I update uploaded the artifact as func demo. So I'm downloading the same artifact here into the path, local path in here and then this is another existing action called Azure Functions action this is this is again built by Azure team so I am just using the app name and then uh, package wherever I have downloaded it and using the published profile we are just publishing it so the published profile as you can see I am referring from a secrets here right? so where I have configured it configured is if you go to settings the repository and go to secrets actions so as you can see, I created these. Um, uh, there are, you can see two different uh, uh, secrets here. One is called enrollment secrets, and there's another thing called repository secrets, right? So whatever the func profile is, repository secrets. That means any any mic sorry any not microservice any workflow wherever you want to use this published profile, you can use it within the repository. Okay. The enrollment part I will cover it when we go to the web app part. So you can you can have different levels of uh, secrets basically. It's not just all the secrets available across everyone in that, micro, in that particular repository. Okay. So now going back here. So this is how we are uh, doing it. And now if you go back to our uh, actions, and let's let's trigger the function app here, right? Let's say I'll go and say run workflow. And that should basically create another uh, you know, workflow here. And as you can see, this chaining. So this is, this happens because we have put that needs there, right? So this guy needs this. So this will wait until this is going to complete. Yeah, build and publish. We run first. Now if I click on this, I can see the live live tail here and what's really happening. So when you check out this, is when it is going to identify what are the commands it's going to run. So, yeah, it is it's doing this. All the things what we have defined in our uh, composite action. It runs this and it uploads an uh, you know, artifact here. I think it's already complete. And now as you can see the next job got triggered, right? Because of our dependency what we have mentioned. So once this is complete, you should see this getting deployed into our Azure uh, you know, function app. I hope I have opened. Which I have uh, created, so if the build gets complete, okay, it's still deploying to it. 
Any questions, Mingwe? Are you all with me? Are you hungry? I see a dead drop silence here. I hope I have not really put you guys to sleep. How Microsoft will position for GitHub Archana as well as DevOps? That's a very tricky question. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, GitHub is more of you know open source and then in entirely with an open source related stuff, right? So, of our everyone and everyone, GitHub Actions is what is actually the future also. But a lot of enterprises are still using Azure DevOps, so that is going to continue for sure. Microsoft has never uh, are not released any official statement that Azure DevOps is done or that or anything like that, right? Even if you looked at the recent Ignite announcements, whatever the GitHub advanced security features, they're all baked into Azure DevOps also. All your, uh, you know, the Dependa bot related things, or uh, code QL scannings and things like that, right? So if, if you're already in your enterprise is on Azure DevOps, then you can continue. But if you're starting afresh, I mean, I'm just sharing my personal view, I'm not a Microsoft employee. I'm just sharing my personal view on how you can, uh, you know, uh, do that, right? If you're starting afresh, yeah, maybe get a background is the way to go. See, but there are a lot of striking differences between both of these tools as well, right? If you look at, at least one of the things which I found very good in uh, Azure DevOps is the release pipelines. How many of you use these pipelines here? That gives a nice view of all the different stages. You can promote things easily and all, right? And you also have an on demand, you can go and create different. Uh, uh, so you create a pipeline, and I have just not deployed it into my dev environment. And maybe after five days, I want to deploy into queue environment. I still be able to do that. But here it's all like fully end to end automated kind of scenario. If you're having this, works much better for that, right? So those release pipelines are not really available in GitHub Actions yet. You have to manage with how I'm showing here, like the deploy to this one. You have to chain multiple jobs like this, and you have to do it. There are good amount of uh, differences, but yeah, like I said, if you're starting afresh and if it's more of, and also this is more of code centric. That is, the release pipeline is more of an UI thing, right? You can't really recode it. I mean, of course, you can export that particular template and then you can process it and then you can create new releases, but this is more of, everything is centered around your repository. That's a kind of model what the industry, so to speak, is moving towards, right? Or anything you want to do, go to the repository, you can find everything. Be it your source code, your documentation, infrastructure, your bill and everything is part of your code, right? So in that sense, GitHub Actions is, is more uh, uh, more relevant and better. Like I said, that's my view. I can't speak for Microsoft for sure, so. <laughs> Sorry, one more question now. Mm -hmm. Can you also put gates here? Like, uh, yes. Yes, we can. So that's what I was going to show in the next one on the function, sorry, the web API. So, yeah, so now this is complete. Now if you go and look at this summary, is where uh, this is what the time it took and everything. And here you can see the artifact. Right? This is the func demo's artifact which we have created. Right, so you also can set up the artifact retention and other things. I haven't put the retention policy there. I think by default it's 30 days after that this will be clear. Otherwise you can put an retention policy here and uh, these artifacts can be downloaded also. If you just click on this, I will be able to download it. If you are using Azure DevOps, you also have artifacts there in edit. You click on artifacts and you can download the entire artifacts of it. The same thing applies here as well. Yeah. So now to see if this is working, I hope I have the link. Yeah, okay, so this is my this one. Yeah, so this is a function, nothing fancy there. Right? So now we're able to deploy the particular function uh, using a GitHub Actions into the Azure app, app function app. Yeah, so I just figured it with Swami. Maybe I'll just say, log in PL, just to change here. You guys don't suspect me that I'm showing cash response. <laughs> it shows a lot of NPL now, okay? <laughs> so yeah, that's about, that's how easily we can actually uh, push things into Azure using this GitHub Actions. Yeah? So far so good? Yes. Great. Okay, now the last part is around the web app, right? So for the web app, what I mean, as you can see here, right? So I've, I've deployed, okay, sorry, the function app, we've just deployed into one Azure function. But typically what we would do is we'll have multiple environments where we want to really deploy our uh, components, right? That is the scenario which I tried to mimic here in the web, app, web API, right? So what I've done is I've an Azure app service, in that I'm going to post this web API. I have to insert this one as a dev, one as a prod. Since this demo, I didn't go all the way to create QA, VP, stage, and other different environments, but you get the point, right? Uh, so, yeah, two things are there. So, now uh, if you look at the function part, what we did, uh, we had to download an artifact and then we have to use this function's action to really publish it into the Azure functions, right? And the same means we also have another action for uh, uh, app, app, sorry, Azure app, web app as well. So, it's the same thing. I want to download the artifact and then I want to publish this into an Azure web app. Right? Otherwise, pretty much all the things are same. App name, the published profile, and the package, everything is the same here, right? So what I did is I kind of created another composite action for this. Now you understand why the composite actions are coming into Pixel helpful. See, if I have to do this in my web API CACD pipeline, say I have these two environments created. Deploy to dev is one job. I'll talk about environments next, and this is another job, deploy to prod, right? 
So now if you see the my entire pipeline is within like 50 lines of code. If I don't do that, this section, whatever I'm going to do is exactly same as what I'm going to do in the deploy to prod as well. One thing that's going to change is your published profile and your app, and your app name. That's all, right? That is what we are trying to make it more repeatable or reusable with the uh, composite actions here. So yeah, so as you can see, there are three three things here. So this uh, front part I'm going to ignore because we already talked about it. And build and publish part also I'll ignore. So deploy to dev. What I've done is it needs a build and push. So one more new addition, what I've done is called environments here. Right? So you can define different environments and you can apply different policies at different environment level. Right? That is where the gates, what you asked about ambush would, would help uh, help us or come into picture. Right? So if you go to settings and if you go to environments here, you can see I created two environments. I can very well go ahead and create one more environment called QA also here. Right? And then when I do go to environment configuration, I can specify how many reviewers are needed for this environment. Right? Let's say in the QA environment I want to just maybe add myself as a reviewer, you can just do that. And the wait timer is nothing but let's say if you are like I said in a fully automated, automated fashion, you deploy your uh, component into one of the environment and then you know your automation test is going to run for maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 1 hour, whatever the time. Right? During that time there is no point in deploying this into a further environment. Right? You want to promote only after your automation tests are complete. And if you know the timing, you can put a wait timer. That means after the deployment is completed in dev environment, it will wait for X, X number of minutes and then it will automatically start triggering the deployment for the next environment. We will just see how it is configured already for production here. And you can also apply these branch rules. Uh, I think I, I maybe I'll show it here in the prod, right? So if you go to prod, I put the reviewers here and I put a wait timer of one minute because I don't want to wait forever in this uh, demo. So I just put one minute here. And then you can also see the branch protection. So anytime a check-in or any push is happening on the main branch, only those will uh, go into the uh, prod environment basically. And here is where I create the environment secrets. So that means what would happen is if you if you look at the name here, I put Azure Web published profile, right? If you go to your uh, dev environment also, I've used the same name, Azure Web App Published Profile, right? Because these are scoped that environment, you can do that. So how it will be scoped is, let's say if you go here, whenever I'm, I need to specify the environment here. If I don't, if I don't specify this environment, it will go and find out if there is anything in the repository level. If it's not finding repository level, it will go and find out if there is anything in the organization level. Right? Let's say at the organization you want to have say, common tokens. Let's say if you're using any enterprise tools with licenses, you don't want to give that to everyone. You might need to have tokens created and then you want to share it across multiple repositories within the organization. Right? That is when you use organization secrets. The next level is repository level secrets and then the more grander level is environment specific secrets. Yeah? So since I've given environment dev, when I say secrets.azure web published profile, it is going to use the published profile what I've saved in that environment. Same thing applies for my prod as well here. Yeah? So here again the chaining is happening, right? This needs build and publish and this needs deployment to dev and uh, after that only the prod is going to uh, get deployed. Yeah, so let's go ahead and run this as well and see how that is going to work. So the API build and deploy. So run workflow. So CI is enabled of course if I can go and make any changes to my web API obviously it's going to trigger the pipeline as well. Now as you can see three different uh, chain has come up and after this you should see an approval of a sort coming into, uh, I mean it will wait for the approval basically before it deploys and deploy to prod. Yeah, as it happens, any questions? Suppose uh, if you want to run on Windows, uh -huh. right now Windows, uh -huh. you have given in YML as Ubuntu latest. Mm. So change there or yeah, yeah. Uh, like we have to create separate file. No, 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 it's not needed. So let's say if you want to run this set of same set of actions across both windows and Linux. Yeah. That is why like I said the matrix strategy you can use. Like how we define matrix and that if you, if you look at that, uh, yeah, well, I created only the .NET versions there. Yes. Right. Like how I have referenced the .NET versions, instead in, in here in the runs on you will use the same thing. Like matrix dot version is what you will use, operating system version. In that matrix you can define Windows, Linux, Mac OS. Then it will automatically run this on those three different operating systems. So if there is any dependency like other C sharp or C plus plus libraries, mm -hmm. we have to declare it here. That is what the setup part will does. If you look at the line number 20, setup.net is an action that was already given. Okay. That is setting up the appropriate version. That's why you also define the version here, right? Let's say if I don't specify the proper version, for example, I am specifying version as 6.0.3 here, not maybe 5.0.3 here, for example. And then if I'm using my application as 6, then that particular build will fail for sure. 
And if you want to do any custom things, you can very well add any other bash scripts you can add. See, what I'm showing is the default actions, right? You can also run uh, run a bash script inside it. You use a shell and then you run a bash script. And then in that, if you want to do any other setup, you can do that. So if you want to download any custom packages, which is from your internal ones. See, and also, this, this, is, this is possible to use because I'm using a cloud hosted runners. If you're using a self hosted runner, you might need to do some more additional th things like I show the scripts and all you have to in include so that it pulls in appropriate dependencies there. Yeah? Matrix only these two features are available, or some other. One is Windows OS, OS related mm -hmm. and version. Mm -hmm. Is there any other? So, wherever you want to do it in a, in a parallel way, you can do it. Let's say if you are running, for example, a Selenium test, if you want to run across multiple browsers, like you want to run across maybe Chrome or Safari or whatever, okay. Mozilla or different other browsers, right? You can run those tests across those different ones. Okay. Yeah. The idea is, yeah, you create a matrix and wherever you want, you know, define the strategy matrix and then in whichever step you want to parallelize it, you can use that. So, I don't know if we cross one minute. Yeah, okay, so here it is uh, waiting for deployment. I could have said waited for one minute. The timer also you would have seen here. Since one minute is over, it just says waiting for deployment here, right? Uh, so, you also get... Oops. Hello? Last one. What did I do? Check, check. Yeah. I think it's back, right? Okay. Yeah, so what I was going to show is you also get email alerts automatically whenever any deployment review or anything is there. So, so yeah. So typically, this is since my GitHub repository, I'm just getting an email. You will get an email like this on your uh, whatever the email you can't fill with your repository. If it's an organization things, you'll get on your email and you can go and review and then uh, approve your deployments from there. So now back to here, so I can just go ahead and approve this. Oops, sorry for approval. Yeah, I'll just say looks good to me. Crack on. Right. And then we'll just push it into broad on a weekend. <laughs> this happens only in demo. Right? <laughs> so yeah, so now this will get deployed and then we should be able to browse the same uh, you know, application from there. The different steps here. So, I think if you just go to setup, job, not the setup, sorry, I think here. Okay. Yeah, so here is where it is selling these things like whatever you define, run GitHub actions deploy to web app. This is what uh, it will first print when we are using composite actions. If you are running directly, you will not see this particular logs there. Now after this, it will write the individual steps in there. See, this is the download artifact part. And then it is next part is running the Azure Web Apps deploy. Here is where we are doing it based deployment, etc. Yeah. So, yeah, so now, I think you answered, your question is answered now. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. So, that's how, yeah, we can build and deploy this here. So, is this free? Is this free to use? Or? That's a great question. Free but limited or restricted. There are certain build uh, minutes itself, um, it is all uh, built based on the minutes what we consume as part of our builds, right? So there is a separate plan for this free users, so we have a subsequent, uh, I mean, good, good amount of free minutes are there for open source projects and other things. The pricing part, there's a detailed pricing page is there in that we can take a look at it. But of course, like I said, free but it's not fully free. You can explore and then you can uh, have to pay for organizational services. Let's say if, if you are on GitHub organization, Right? I mean, GitHub Enterprise Cloud, uh, for example, right? Then obviously, for the enterprise license, you'll be given a specific set of minutes. So, the entire organization can burn that minutes only. If somebody is running a long running build by mistake, then of course, yeah, you are done, you have to wait. <laughs> yes, you have a question? Yeah. The hash 10 is a build number. Which one? The number 10? Yeah. Yeah, that's around ID, yeah. Right. So, but we can see all the builds, what other things are running. So, here, if you go to this workflow, so this is the place where you can see all the previous builds here. Okay. Yeah. So as you can see, I've done so many mistakes as any other developer. I've just <laughs> learned by failing the builds and then I pushed it. So is that what you are looking for? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. from one of the builds we are doing and are developing, so mm. we, from there we can uh, start from production. Correct. Okay. So here you can go and check uh, check out these events also, right? Workflow dispatch. How many have run with the workflow dispatch here? Right? and how many builds are running with an uh, push here. 
Uh, I cannot have anything with the push because yeah, only the initial commit data is done here, right? So you can do all those filtering here. In the statuses also you can go and filter. And if you want to look for any other specific branches, you can do that. Or if you want to look for any specific uh, person who, for whom you have created the build, you can also take a look at that. Right. And deployments, if you go, you can see what deployments have happened. Like this is a deployment history, broad day one of things. So this is what I was saying. If you are an Azure release pipeline, you'll have that nice UI view of okay, what is there in which environment, what version of that particular build is in which environment, etc. That is not at the moment available. So you can just go to this deployment environments here and then you can see, say the dev is having this particular hash ID at the shop basically, right? And then the prod is also having the same code. So it's more of code same thing like I said, right? So you, 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 you want to get all the details in your repository itself, you don't have to go to multiple places to look at what is really happening here and there, etc. That's where this works better. You can show one of the failures just for people to know how they can debug it. Oh yeah, it's a good call out. One minute. So I think what I did is yeah. So let's say this one. I I set up the matrix build for my library project. One mistake what I did is I had the global JSON file defined at my root level to have all the .NET version set as 6.0 point text, right? But and then I forgot to remove that and then I created this. So when this build ran, so it says you know could not execute because the application was not found for a compatible SDK, right? It says uh, this. See, if you look at the setup part, it had set up the .NET 5 appropriately. Of course, .NET 5 is no longer supported. Just for demo purpose, I've used this, so don't go and try it at home. Uh, so I, we have set up this and the in the runner level, but actually in my in the global JSON gets the priority, right? Whenever .NET is trying to run a particular build, we to look at the version from what is mentioned in the global JSON file. That had a 6.0.403, but the runner was on 5.x, so it couldn't really do that, right? So then what I had to do is I had to remove the global JSON file, which is what you should see in my pre in the next uh, this one. Oh yeah, actually the push was all on the this one. What to say? We go to this push here. So you can see I deleted this global JSON. After that, the next subsequent run when I did by uh, this one, it, it worked. So, I mean, why it didn't automatically trigger? Can anyone tell? So, this is what is my li library builds events, right? When I deleted global JSON, it didn't trigger automatically. Why? So, you didn't write push event? I have a push event there now. This is an impromptu push, I just planned now only. <laughs> <laughs> so, why do you think it didn't trigger automatically and why you had to trigger because manually? This is for library demo. Global was exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to path filter there, right? So it just looks for only change in that particular path. But whatever I deleted is outside of it. So that's why it didn't trigger basically. Anand, your munch is for you. But if you guys ask questions, sorry, I, I think one, one of you was you, right? Who else? Somebody from the back. Just raise your hands and <laughs> Yes. There are more ways here in the box, you can simply raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so being very honest to our audience. <laughs> okay, I think that's pretty much I had. How much time I have? I think I just yeah. burned my time. My minutes are over. Okay. Any, any other questions from anyone? I have. If there are no questions, just... Is there any chance we can like debug uh, the TML in local? Before pushing it to okay, yeah, there are third-party uh, things available. There is a runner, a local particular. I, I don't remember the name of it exactly. I'll, I'll take a look at it and send it to you. Okay, yeah, there is one. There was someone created in the community to run these actions locally. So the question is, can I run these actions locally before even committing into the repository and then get it executed by the actual GitHub runners? Okay, there is a possibility, but not from GitHub directly. There's a third-party uh, tool available for that. I'll, I'll share that link separately. Uh, web configs are there, right? Mm -hmm. Can we uh, replace the values uh, yes. using this? Yes, you can do that, yes. So the same thing we can set it up for multiple environments also? Okay. Yeah. See, that's what I said. If you don't have an existing task, there are multiple ways to do it, right? Either you get a custom action for yourself and then publish it. Or you can run scripts, bash scripts or partial scripts or whatever scripts you can run it. In those scripts, you can run your own code to whatever uh, updation you want to do with there. Any other questions? I'm sure food will be ready, so you can answer the questions. <laughs>
Do you have time for this not here yet? Oh, is it? Oh, <laughs> I don't have any other demos. Maybe I can just show one more thing if you guys are interested to understand how you can create the infrastructure. Can I? Yes. But not in this repo, but yeah, in another repository, I've given a talk on different uh, group. So you can take a look at that as well. So Terraform, how many of you know Terraform? Or uh, heard Terraform? Sorry, I think that should be the right question. <laughs> heard about Terraform? Yes. Yes? Okay. Use Terraform? Okay. Planning to use Terraform? <laughs> no, okay. So I believe it should be here. Yeah. So again, for this also I use this. Uh, I just show it here. Yeah. How many of you know this part, this trick in GitHub? You can open a VS Code in build editor in the browser. GitHub.dev. How do you do that? Dot click somewhere it will open somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. You just need to press dot in the context of your browser window, then it automatically opens in github.dev. Otherwise, what you can do is just go here and then change this dot com to dot dev. Let's say if you go change it to dot com, it will open my github repository. Right? If you go here and then change this, I'm sure if you know the dot shortcut, you'll never go and do this. That's more easier and straightforward. Right? You go and change it to github.dev, then automatically it opens up in the browser. So you can't really run any commands or anything here. So for that you would need to use something called code spaces. That's a different thing altogether. But at least any kind of static file, let's say you read new document you want to update, or if you want to just quickly review your PR, and if you want to navigate through your different files, etc. Right? You can do all of those things in the web version here. So here, as you can see, it's an it's an uh, VS Code, and it also tries to sync your uh, VS Code settings if you log in. I don't think I've logged in, so it might not have done it. Okay, I just having this. Yeah, so here, uh, this particular repository, what I'm having is an, uh, you know, Terraform uh, file here, basically a simple Terraform to create some of the, uh, basically same thing, Azure, uh, for, to, for us to create an Azure web app, you need to have an app service plan, and then you need to have your Azure app service created, and then you need to link both of them, right? That's exactly what is being done here. So as you can see, I'm creating a resource group, and then I'm creating an app service plan, and inside the app service plan, I'm creating a Linux web app here, okay? And like the same thing for you know different tests and products as group I created. Yeah, the point of discussion here is on the workflows part, right? So now again here also uh, here I didn't use any composite actions. So here if you go and look at the terraform.yml file. So the same thing here, I put the path filters for this particular uh, terraform folder alone. And here is where the terraform specific parts are running. So terraform runs in multiple steps, right? You need to do an init of it first so that it initializes the entire uh, system with the corresponding terraform modules and other things. And then you need to really do a plan. So to run the plan is nothing but that is see how you guys understood what is Terraform? Or infrastructure as code? How many of you heard this term? Infrastructure as code. What does it mean? We codify your infrastructure. You create some sort of code and then from the code your infrastructure gets created, right? Yeah. So you can think of let's say if I want to like okay, show the snippet here, I will just define how my resource group should look like, what is the name of it, what is the location of it, and then something happens under the hood magically and then it gets created in the Azure part, right? That something under the hood is what Terraform is taking care of for us. So how does it do? Basically it compares your, it's a desired state configuration. So we have this term called desired state configurations. Yeah, so you have, you are defining what is your desired state here, and then somebody else is going to ensure that you are going to reach a desired state. Right? That somebody again here is Terraform for us. So how does it do? It needs to compare what is the uh, desired state you want to go in, and what is the current state. Right? So it maintains something called a state, I think, but what is the current state of my resource groups there. Right, it needs to to Azure and look at what is my current state of resource group. It see okay, whatever the new state I'm trying to push in, new resource group I'm going to create, new app service plan, new app, all these are available there or not. It will check. If it's available, it will try to modify the elements whatever you are giving. If it's not available, it's going to create it. That entire the evaluation part is what is called a plan here. So it does a Terraform plan first and then uh, it will also run a Terraform apply. Apply is when you would basically run an uh, application. Sorry, it will go and actually create the infrastructure, right? So here, what I wanted to show is, so this is an environment variable for I've created. So forget about that, I'm not teaching Terraform here. Some of the GitHub part is, these are the existing actions what we are using. So as you can see here, this is something coming from the HashiCorp Terraform GitHub Action Update Master. That means we are pulling this action from HashiCorp slash Terraform GitHub Action Repository in GitHub and using a master branch. So you can also change, let's see if you are experimenting some of your custom actions across your, across your enterprise, right? You can create a specific repository in which you push these actions, you can define different uh, different branches there, right? And then you can pull the specific action from a specific branch. 
Either you can go with a branch or you can go with an uh, versioning also. That's this way, yeah, tax. So if you look at the previous ones where I showed, we said uh, uh, check out at V2, sorry, dot net at V2, this at V3, right? These are the tags what is created on those repositories. Two ways you can pull the actions here. And some more things to look at is, and this in this actually I've also been updating the pull request. So for example, if you want to understand my your Terraform output, right? Let's say the plan runs, it should say how many needs to be applied, how many needs to be deleted, how many needs, sorry, how many needs to be created, how many to be updated, how many to be deleted. Right? All those will come into the, your steps. So if you want to publish that into your summary itself, you can uh, do this. That is what is this snippet doing. So the GitHub token and then this is a script as you can see, this is a script which is being run there. And in this below, as you can see, this is a, this is these are all some of the nice things about using GitHub Actions. You can use basically I'm updating that particular comment there for the issue. For if a pull request is created, for example, the workflow is here like this, right? You can't really create your infrastructure directly, right? In the demo sake, I was doing everything in main branch. Otherwise, you have to have your feature branch somewhere. You will code your whatever new infrastructure you want to create and modify it. You create a pull request. Now as part of the pull request, what if I just go and update telling you, you know what, these are the set of uh, things that's going to change and these are the set of things that's going to be deployed, etc. Okay? That is what is getting updated in this comment. I'm not sure if I have that. It's still available. Let me check once again. I can show what I'm talking about. This is So this is what I was talking about. See, in this pull request itself, when my pull request action runs, it, it goes and shows here. So Terraform format and shading is success, initialization is success, plan is success. And then if you see the plan, show plan, it will just show, I think maybe some mistake, it will show the plan. Basically, each of these steps, whatever we are running here, right? I'm just emitting the output of each of these steps into uh, this particular uh, summary. So it, it becomes a lot easier for anyone to review the PR, right? You don't have to really go and look at, okay, hey, you know what, what is your plans output or what is your this output, that output, etc. You can publish everything into a uh, PR as a PR comment itself. This is, all, this is also possible with GitHub Actions, which is what this snippet is doing here. As you can see, just say steps.plan.outcome. So, of course, these things need to be emitted from those individual steps what we are running. It doesn't happen automatically. Let's see, if you are to create a similar thing, right? You need to set your action output into a specific variable called GitHub underscore output as an environment variable. Then you can read that output from subsequent actions or any other actions. Yeah. I know it's getting a little bit of into intermediate level of GitHub actions thing, but just may just for you to get an idea, I'm just sharing this. So it's not just only pure C A C D, that's one aspect of it, but you can do a lot more with actions, is, is the point what I'm trying to try. Only easy questions, okay. <laughs> what is it? Uh, uh, line 24. 24. Yeah, so I was just talking about this in the previous demo as well. So you can create different environments. I'll maybe go to this and then show here to be easier. That is my So if you go back to our today's repository groups. So you can define multiple environments within your repositories, okay? And then that environments you can define different environment specific secrets and environment specific production rules and other things. Then what would happen is when you let's say for example I've like given these two environments here, dev and prod. If you go to my dev environment, I've created a specific secret called Azure Web App Publish Profile. So this would be applicable whenever I'm doing a deployment in that dev environment only. Right? And also I can apply any other production rules and other things. So now if I go to my prod here, I've configured these rules. Right? I want a reviewer to be applied. So, if you are managing this kind of different uh, deployments, different environments, you can do that. See, ultimately what changes in here, for an Azure web app thing, the published profile is what is going to be different between two environments. Right? That is one thing we are managing the secrets. But apart from that, any other production rules is what is applicable at an environment level. Is this uh, environment only available in GitHub Enterprise or is this... No, it's available in public repositories, not for private repositories. So that was one minute. I'll just show a thing. I might also have some trial repositories. It wouldn't be showing up there. I'm not using enterprise, especially my, my personal account only. 
but what I think this is a private repository. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah actually, yeah, environment environments are available, but I believe uh, something else is yeah the branch rules or something. I felt it was only in public. It said. Yeah, the approvals are not available in the public repositories, not on the private, yeah. See, as you can see, the branch production rules are there, secrets are still there, but if you want to enable approvals, it's, it's not present in that. It's not required because if it's a private repository, you might not even need it there, yeah. In Azure DevOps, uh, it's available by default for all, uh, for all uh, whether it's public or private. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like in GitHub, yeah. See, that the environment concept itself is different, right? it's not centered on your repository, it's more on the Azure DevOps level, it, they have set it up. You create an environment and then you can apply any approval rules on top of that. But here it's more of repository everything, that's why it's all uh, tied to your repository and the plan and things like that. Yeah. Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> any, any other questions? How long food is going to Any questions from anyone? If not, yeah, you can just yes, please. How do you reuse? Uh, I don't know if you covered this, but uh, yeah. reusing uh, templates. Yeah. So there is a concept called composite actions, which uh, I've created here. Yeah, you can create this um, action thing called using composite, and then you you give the steps here. All the steps what I want to run as part of composite action, and you will consume it in your other uh, this one. So here, if you look at it. I deploy to this one for example, right? I am using it here, users get a back and deploy to web app with these other inputs. Right? This particular action is deployed, I mean, uh, uh, created here as a composite action with these uh, three inputs I have defined here and these are two steps what I am running in that particular composite action. So what I showed is just a composite action, you can also have something called reusable workflow. For example, these are the entire set of things I want to run for all of my .NET applications as running dependent Azure app service. Right? Then you can create a reusable workflow itself. That will even make your entire workflow file very concise. Now I have used only composite actions here. But yeah, so that for that what you need to do is you need to get something called on workflow call. So here if you look at it in the function, sorry, in the here, we just say on push here, right? So you will also have something called workflow call. And as you see workflow call, right? That is what would that is what you would use to create a reusable workflow, and then you would use a workflow run to call your uh, reusable workflow from any of your current workflows. Else? Did you guys learn something new? Yes. Yes? Okay. What the visit for the Saturday morning? This day back after lunch also, the more interesting sessions are lined up. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you guys using in enterprises? Yes. Yes. So, we are, we are currently using Azure DevOps and we are trying to move everything towards GitHub Actions actually. So, one of our strategies is to have everything in one source control. That's why we are using GitHub as our primary as one, not having multiple tools around. So all our source control is on GitHub and then the actions we are trying to use to move a lot of our builds and CAC part into it. Artifacts also. GitHub also has a lot of things. Artifacts can also be pushed into GitHub packages. You can also set up your container registries there, you can set up your NuGet packages, you can set up your uh, whatever Java package store and everything, right? So you can, we also use those as well. Yeah. So it's all yeah, under a single uh, place. So where you have deployed? Uh, enterprises one? It's enterprise cloud. So there are two different versions of enterprise available in GitHub. You can use GitHub Enterprise Server, that means you host on your own infrastructure. The other one is GitHub Enterprise Cloud, that means they host on everything on themselves. You will be given an organization and then all of your things will be under your organization, all the repositories, all the secrets and all your uh, different uh, things, whatever you do, everything is under your organization. And you can of course uh, add that or enable that organization with an Azure AD, but integrate that with Azure AD so that only authorized people who are part of that Azure AD only will be able to access to that organization. Just the same replica of your uh, DevOps, right? Yes, your DevOps, it seems like. Yeah, sort of similar ways. That also you get dev.azure.com slash one organization you will create and then through that you will have multiple team projects you will create there. But here with an organization you can get multiple teams. There's also a concept of GitHub teams in GitHub. Let's say if I'm part of maybe platform one or something like that, then I can just say platform team. If somebody is part of QA, you can create a QA team. And you can apply the collaborator access and other things on that particular team. 
Okay, so then uh, task management and project management will also come here? Is Not it? yet. That is still on uh, ESG and things like that. Yeah. But it has an option to do that. Yes. Oh. Boards are also there. Data boards are there. You can use to do that. It's not as feature rich, at least as far as I've seen. Uh, if you are using Jira, it's not as feature rich, but yeah, it is good. We can create badges of build, right? Uh, yes. Can we create the dashboard out of it? Like, uh, so yeah, the visualization part is, is not fully there. Even for that matter, let's say if you are in, uh, if you are publishing a test report, right? There is not much of a built-in report to reporting to level two here. If you are using Azure DevOps, the moment you publish a test, you get a tab called test tab. Moment you publish the code coverage, you have a tab called code coverage. You can you see in that particular build only, right? But that is not available yet. So the recommendation is if you can upload this artifact, like your test XMLs, whatever you get out of it, right? you can go publish into a GitHub pages or something like that. So you have a common page to go and look at all of those. Uh, I mean the results. Yeah. Naturally, we have hosted agents, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have our own static IPs. In it's called self-hosted runners here, yes, there is an option, it is called self-hosted runners, yeah. I've also done a couple of videos around that in, in YouTube, you can check a look at that. You can configure self-hosted runners. So basically you need to just go to your uh, uh, settings and then you can add those. Let me check if I have that self-hosted runner. Yeah. So this is something I did two years back, so I don't know if the settings are all available, but give you an idea. Runners. Yeah, so here is where you can go and configure your self hosted runner. Right? Let's say if you want to configure this machine, you can just create a self hosted runner and then it comes up with all these different steps. Run these steps and then this machine will get connected to your uh, GitHub and you will give an ID to this particular uh, name. See, as you can see in the bottom, it says self hosted, right? You just give that and then that, that runs on, then it automatically all the bills will go into this. But of course, you don't want to connect to your laptop because you close it, then your runner is gone. You don't want to use it on any of your uh, you know, provision VMs or so. It's very much possible. Yeah. yeah, so even deploying this into an Azure uh, web app for containers or AKS cluster, I've done a couple of videos, you can also take a look at it. Maybe. So if you go to the repository, also this GitHub AKS demo. I think it's called AKS demo if I'm not wrong. Yeah, GitHub Actions AKS demo. So this has actions to really deploy your uh, basic .NET app into an you know, AKS cluster. So uh, here is where you set your, you know, you need to basically build your Docker image and also that is what these three steps are doing. And then you have to set your Kubernetes context to the repository, to the Kubernetes cluster where you want to deploy. And then you can uh, perform the deploy, actual deployment steps below. Yeah. So, uh, you guys are moving towards uh, uh, the Azure right? Mm -hmm. Did you guys get cost benefit analysis? With, uh, because there, in DevOps, we get a lot of uh, free features. Mm. As enterprise engagement, right? Mm. So, yeah, to be honest, I'm not part of that team who actually takes their decision on the DevOps tooling part of it. So I'm sure they would have done it. But here also it's all license based. Even DevOps is all license based. If you have premium license or basic license or standard license and things like that, right? Uh, so here it's all on the per user basis, it's an enterprise level. So I'm sure some would have done it. Yeah, I don't have details on what is the pricing and uh, what kind of uh, pricing benefits you will get by moving towards this. But anyhow, you would be having sense that with this we are going to save money, right? Is it? I am not sure about the money part, but one thing what, uh, what Swami also was saying is it's more about the tooling perspective, right? Because yeah. most of the team was started having code in the GitHub and we wanted to, you know, source some of these things and all that. So we want to have that kind of standardization. So why the code is coming into GitHub, right? Why can't we, you know, use the GitHub actions and pages and whatnot, right? Because so, so to improve the developer experience of the user developer. developer. So let's say you have that. some teams using Jenkins, some teams using Azure DevOps, some other teams using something else. I think standards all of it, then it becomes a lot easier for everyone to also work along or move along the enterprise as well. That don't have to be drivers. Cost per se, yeah, it might be same because of course the pricing is all coming from Microsoft, it's all both the same things, right? Same products. So I don't I don't really know. But one thing is, let's say if you are having GitHub as a repository, you need to have license for that. Plus, if you are also going to use Azure DevOps as another tool for build and everything, you also need to have license for that. Right? That will be definitely saved if at all we are freeing up the entire Azure DevOps part and move everything into GitHub. Right. If you are using Azure Repos there, then it's a different scene altogether. Right? Because you are already having license and you are using that entire suite of products. If you are using boards, repos, pipelines and releases and everything, that, that's a different thing. So you don't really need to move just for the sake of it into another uh, ecosystem. That's what see, both of, there are multiple tools available, right? Again, it's not the only tool, even GitLab also has a similar feature set in it, right? It's all about the ecosystem, what you are in and what you are trying to build, etc. There's no one says it's all for share. So, Swami, so, uh, 
Swami, with all the automation, do you think that the DevOps engineer role will go up? Who will automate it? First, the solution will automate it. As a management developer does everything. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not really that way, right? So, like I said, the YAML. Developers can debug with the, from the log file, dot .NET code, but not the YAML failures, right? <laughs> So yeah, there's nothing like uh, DevOps engineers or the, uh, anything will go away. So it's all about improving our own productivity and things like that, right? And someone needs to also maintain this. If something is going wrong, who is going to address all of this? Like I said, if we're talking at enterprise level, you definitely need a lot more engineers. If you want to enable a new security scans everything into it, how do you ensure it is getting across all the different repositories and how do you ensure all the different uh, different teams are all uh, by the, uh, I mean, adopting it, right? So definitely I don't see any, any jobs going away. It's going to be more jobs being created to do these automations in my view. The DevOps engineer is busy with the DevOps tooling. Different yeah. tools in open source, managing, yeah. integrating and yeah. so all that. See, even now, right, though this is at GitHub, let's say maybe one enterprise might use Azure, some other enterprise might use AWS, maybe and the same enterprise will become multi-cloud. Right. Then how do you ensure all of these things are happening in the right fashion, right? How do your deployments, your bills and your monitoring, all of things are there. So of course there will be definitely more uh, work. DevOps work. Yeah. See, yeah, I understand the infrastructure part could be a little uh, reduced, right? Because you don't have to really create your own uh, infrastructure if you're completely on public cloud. But on the other hand, if you're trying to build a private cloud, it adds more work on the, uh, the DevOps side anyways, right? Yes. Uh, let's say using completely on cloud native tools, building your own Kubernetes clusters, managing them, patching them and everything like that. If you're building your own private cloud of clusters, then it's going to be another uh, bigger task base. So that needs a separate cloud engineering kind of an, uh, team. Alright, I think we can break for lunch. Yeah.